All right, let me just get my slide there. All right, so I am talking about, oops, sorry, comics and the Gothic today. Um, and I'm gonna start by talking about uh, more traditional comic Gothic stories, and then later move into some ways that comics have sort of messed with Gothic tropes which is why this is called Comics in the Gothic, Messing with Your Castle, Telling Your Secrets, and Stealing Your Girl, because ultimately that is what happens. Um, gonna start with a little comics history. So this whole idea sort of came to me when Dr. Hurst was telling us uh, about the Penny Dreadfuls, because they are essentially the comics of their day. Um, they are pop culture themes, they were cheap, they were serialized, and they were sensational. There was murder and the supernatural, um, all kinds of exciting things. And they were sort of aimed at, at the younger demographic, uh, which was also true of comics, um, especially at the beginning when they focused much more on superheroes than on anything else. Um, again, pop culture themes, they were cheaper. Um, they're more expensive than they used to be, although they're still cheaper than a, a book. Uh, they're serialized. You get story arcs. Um, they're pretty sensational. This is a very sensational picture of Batman. Um, I picked this one because he has a great cape. Uh, Dustin Wynn does great capes. So if you're, if you're looking for that aesthetic, I highly recommend his art. Um, uh, so the history of comics, some people will try to connect it back to the cave paintings in France at Lascaux. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, but the point that those people are making is that people have essentially, since they started telling stories, always told stories with pictures. So while I think making that connection, like I said, is definitely a stretch, the idea of telling stories with pictures solely or with pictures attached obviously is not new. Um, other scholars have tried to tie it in to uh, some of the art from 12th century Japan, which again is probably a stretch, although Japan does have a very strong comics tradition. Um, there was a series uh, in Europe in the 1830s that was specifically social commentary with pictures, which is probably makes a little more sense as a, a first place to start with comics, it was strips. But where we really start to see it um, as a popular storytelling uh, method was in the 1930s with things like Tintin and um, US newspaper strips. Uh, I do not recommend going back to look at the old Tintin strips. They're ridiculously, terrifyingly racist. Um, a lot of things in comics are of their time, which is something that definitely needs to be interrogated, although that is a whole other lecture series. Like, you couldn't even fit that into one lecture. That would be like a four semester class minimum. Um, so there are things we're going to deal with today that yes, they need to be interrogated or they are being interrogated. And I can certainly point people in the right direction to look at that commentary if they're interested. Um, and then in 1939, we got some of the first comic books, which were Superman. Um, about the same time we started seeing comic books in Japan. Uh, so we had this, during World War II, there was sort of this explosion of superhero comics. Um, you have probably seen images of Superman, Captain America, Wonder Woman, punching Nazis. We love those. Um, after World War II, there was kind of a, a dip in the superhero stories, and then a lot of them came back sort of reimagined as, as science fiction stories. Uh, Green Lantern, particularly, you see that. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing to trace, um, if you have interest in sort of tracing that history is to do it through uh, the Green Lantern comics. 
Um, so first thing we're going to do is look at um, how comics interpreted the Gothic traditionally. Um, and I kind of did that through aesthetics, which as we've talked about in Dr. Hurst lectures is not the whole story, but it's kind of representative, at least where comics are concerned. Um, so the top left is Wayne Manor, which is a very Gothic house. But we also have Gothic elements of the story. We have a dead parents. Uh, we have a basement full of tunnels and bats and creepy things and uh, being used for sometimes nefarious and sometimes heroic purposes. Um, then under that is the Sanctum Sanctorum, which is Dr. Strange's house, which is in the middle of Greenwich Village. It's a very lovely house on the outside. And on the inside is all kinds of creepy occult stuff and demons living in the basement. Uh, in fact, at one point in the story, Dr. Strange can't eat normal human food anymore. He has to eat demon parts. So like the house is full of all these demon bits that he has to eat uh, to do his magic. The middle one is particularly interesting. Um, that's the House of Mystery, which features in with the DC magical characters. Um, it is a sentient house. It can embody itself and that embodiment can walk around itself. Um, it can go where it wants. It picks its own owner. So it picks who's in charge of it. Um, and it's involved in a lot of the DC mystical stories that will show up to save people or disappear people as it so chooses. Um, the one with the airships I picked for Dr. Hurst because we were joking about airships one day. That is Xavier's Mansion though, which is a school for mutant children. So it was somewhere in upstate New York, which is not quite New England Gothic, but sort of framed the same way where people who are different can go to be safe, which we'll talk about when I talk about New England Gothic. And then we've also talked about this element of the um, quote unquote, we hate the word, but we're gonna use it, exotic in the Gothic. Um, and that is Nanda Parbat, which is on a mountain in Tibet, which you may have heard about if you watched the Arrow TV show, or if you have read any Green Arrow. Um, it is supposedly on a mountain in Tibet, and it is where the League of Assassins is based. Uh, but the other interesting thing about it is that it's the base of Rachel Ghoul, who is an eco-terrorist, which is, again, its own really interesting thing. Um, but he has in his possession what's called the Lazarus Pit, which uh, can revive you if you are dying or dead. So it's essentially the aqua vitae, uh, which is something a lot of the gothic characters are looking for. However, unless you have an incredibly strong will, using it will drive you crazy. So there's, there's your punishment for uh, trying to do that. So <laughs> another literal way that the Gothic has been interpreted by uh, comics is that we have these illustrated classics. Uh, these were big in the United States in the 50s and 60s um, because they're illustrated classics, which means they're co not comic books, they're illustrated classics and that made them accessible reading material, uh, mostly for boys. My dad had a lot of them. Um, as you can see, it's very majestic. Um, the inside, I couldn't fit pictures, but it's hilarious. Um, the art is terrible, but it was a good way to expose children to classic literature, which um, David Walker, who is a filmmaker and a, a comics writer, discussed at a panel for educators, actually, at uh, Emerald City Comic Con. I wrote 2019, I think it may have been 2018. Um, a, a lot of teachers, excuse me one second, I have to let my cat out, he's being a dork. Sorry, he's very old and cranky. Um, I can't decide where he wants to be. Uh, so this was actually a talk for educators because a lot of 
educators are still very hesitant to use comics, which is very silly because what comics do, and what the illustrated classics did, is make stories, any story, more accessible to everyone, to anyone. Um, so David talked about this in the idea of he was writing a biography of Frederick Douglass. And he chose to write it in a graphic memoir format because he said he is writing it for mostly for kids, but also for adults to access for people who have different educational background. So people who may not have had the same level as education, people who did not go to school for as long, people, you know, everyone. Hamilton, the musical, was based on the Chernow biography, which is, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like this. I have a master's degree and I couldn't get through it. So if you're 11 and you're interested in Frederick Douglass, that's a lot, which is not to say no 11 year olds could do it, but you're gonna be much more engaged by a graphic memoir. There's less text. There are pictures, so if there are words you don't know, instead of having to stop and look them up or not understanding, you're gonna have an image to cue you in into what it means. So it makes not only stories, but history much more accessible to people. And it also provides a way to kind of skirt around the gatekeepers who are not wanting people to know things, many things. Um, so the Illustrated Classics did that as well. Oops. Another way that comics have interacted with um, the Gothic is as parody. Um, this is something that Neil Gaiman wrote. Um, and essentially what he did was shove every possible Gothic trope into it. So it's based on a found manuscript about an orphan maiden who, while fleeing from a terrible but attractive lord of the manor who is interviewing her for a governess position, happens upon, on this very particular night of nights, a derelict castle, which happens to have been owned by her dead parents, so it's her inheritance, uh, provided that she appeases the monsters who live in it with brides but also these little bread roll things that I don't, that there was this one panel that really cracked me up. So they're like, we need brides, but also rolls. Um, according to a contract that she finds in a secret compartment in the writing desk, while there is literally a raven sitting on her shoulder yelling in her ear, right? So not only is it hilarious, but it also allows you to pull out each of these elements and kind of turn them around and look at them. and look at why they're interesting, why they became tropes in the first place, and sort of where we've gone from them, and also where we maybe need to move on from them a little bit, um, and where we can continue to tell stories in a similar vein, but maybe need to change a little bit. Um, so also, super funny. I highly recommend this one. I was laughing the whole time I was reading it. So that's the European side. So where do we go with it on the American end of things? Because American Gothic, it's a big category, but it also divides up very specifically depending on which region of the United States you're in. So comics have dealt with all of this. Um, sort of together with this general American sensibility, but then also separately. Um, and then I picked this one specifically and a couple of other ones because they feature this incredibly Gothic character named Dead Man. Um, his name is Boston Brand. He's from New England, which is a whole, New England Gothic is its own thing, which we'll talk about. Um, when he started as a character, he, he is an acrobat, which is a thing in DC. They really like acrobats, trapeze artists in particular, um, who was shot in the middle of a performance. 
resurrected by this Hindu goddess. Why Hindu goddess? Nobody knows. It is never explained. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find it. Um, it's that quote unquote exotic thing again. This character is from the 60s. So take that as you will. Um, and his soul is sticking around to help people. But there's this kind of weird edge to it, which is that his power is that he can possess people, but he doesn't have to ask first. Like he just jumps into people's bodies and it's very shady and uncomfortable. And then once he leaves, they don't remember. So they have no idea what has happened to them or what they've done while he's in their body. So that's weird. And some of what he does while he's in their body is sometimes kind of shady. Um, <clears throat> And then, uh, for those of you who haven't read a lot of comics, the, the two really big comic companies, which is DC and Marvel, they periodically feel like they've run out of stories. So they'll do a big reboot on their universe. Um, and when DC rebooted their universe in the er early 2000s, um, they changed his origin a little bit and he was not a good person in his first life. So, the goddess who resurrected him and it's the same goddess and it would have been nice if they had taken the opportunity to undo that nonsense but they didn't um he is sticking around to make up for the fact that he was not a nice person um he's still not terribly nice though and he can still and does still possess people without asking uh however people who have a very strong will can resist or kick him out. And the person we see do that most often is Batman, who's kind of uh, the liaison between the superheroes and the magical group in DC Comics. Um, because the, and this is an interesting dynamic, which we can talk about at a different point. Uh, the superheroes in DC can, are affected by magic. So like Superman is affected by magic. And Batman as the non-powered capes and tights hero is the liaison between them. I'm sure there's deep gothic meeting in there somewhere. Um, so this is from the 80s, which you can probably tell from the art, um, which was less subtle in its gothic storytelling. So this is another case where they kind of took everything from the quote unquote American gothic and shoved it into one story. Um, which is that, you know, my husband was really very sweet despite the occasional murderous rage. And then he built this house and a freak show carnival on an ancient Native American burial ground, even though the local tribe told him not to, because it would draw the wrath of an evil demon, which it did. And still, who would have thought he would ever have murdered me and trapped my spirit? And have I mentioned his name is Byron? So... <laughs> Uh, this was the days before comics were a little more subtle. Um, and actually in this same book, oh no, it's this story, I'm sorry. They are in the woods in New England where there are ancient Roman ruins. So when I say they literally shoved everything that they could into it, they literally shoved everything they could into it. Um, but as time went on, comics got a little more subtle and they started to actually cover different regions of the United States and those separate types of Gothic, which are actually very different. Um, one that most people know about is the Southern Gothic. Um, the foundational figures were Poe and Faulkner. Uh, this is an arc from 1988, which also features Dead Man. So when we're talking about the Southern Gothic, talking about a, a sense of alienation, but the big thing that we're talking about is this idyllic notion that you still hear if from some people in the south if you talk to them about it of this sort of like antebellum nice idyllic pastoral life versus the historical reality of slavery and people being torn away from their homes and loaded into the holds of ships and brought over here and the way that they were treated so what we see a lot of times in the Southern Gothic is that these repressed historical realities become actual ghosts. Like they feature in the story 
not as a metaphor, but as actual ghosts. Not always, sometimes they're metaphors, but in the ones that, in the stories that are actually supernatural, they become the ghosts. So in this particular story arc, um, Dead Man wakes up in a cemetery in New Orleans, which is the seat of Southern Gothic. Um, and partly because of its connection with voodoo, which is still not terribly well understood because people who actually really practice voodoo don't talk about it very much for good reason. Um, and side note, if you ever have a chance to go to the Voodoo Museum in New Orleans, go because it's actually an active worship space. So you get real information and it's very cool. Um, so he wakes up in the cemetery and uh, these guys are digging up a body that is then raised as a zombie to go kidnap these two little girls. And there's this whole complicated plot, but ultimately what is happening is the ghosts of that of twin white women who had lived on this plantation are stealing these black girls' bodies to resurrect their plantation life. So it is a very literal interpretation of historical reality taking over this pastoral ideal and trying to resurrect it. Um, and then, you know, obviously in, in the end, the girls are saved and the ghosts are not entirely banished, which is interesting and also very true to history. Um, so then we move to the New England Gothic, which is actually the kind of Gothic that scares me the most. I was explaining this morning because I grew up in New England. So this is what I read. This was this sort of the sensibility that I inherited as a kid. Um, and this is a very different kind of Gothic than Southern Gothic. Uh, what we have here is this Puritan veneer, but we're cracking it and we're kind of peeking underneath this society where everyone is expected to be very much the same and very well behaved. Um, and this is where we get our mad women in the attics and our spinsters in dying villages. Um, and what comes out in these stories is hypocrisy and inbreeding and intergenerational curses. Um, and the horror and the evil come from the past and it's tied into this fear of wild spaces, which I think a lot of people don't realize we still have a fair bit of in America. And in New England, people think of, you know, Boston, you think of cities, but the coast is still, parts of the coast are still very wild. Um, so the foundational figures here are H.P. Lovecraft, and then later on we sort of get a second wave with Shirley Jackson. So like we have always lived in this castle and haunting of Hill House. Um, the comic I picked for this one is Lock and Key, which uh, there's a Netflix series of the first arc of the comic, which is actually very good. Um, and you get definitely, the, they've changed a lot, but you get the sensibility of the comic, which I think in this case is the important part. Um, and what you have in this, this is by Joe Hill and uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Rodriguez. Joe Hill is a horror writer, for those of you who don't know, he's Stephen King's son, which he actually kept secret for a very long time. Apparently his agent and publisher were furious when they found out. Um, I kind of love it. <laughs> Uh, so what you have here is this family who lives in Seattle and the, the father of the family is from New England um, and his family has this big old house in Lovecraft, Massachusetts. Why would you move there? Like I said this morning, in the DC universe there's this town called Bloodhaven that even has an umlaut and why would you ever move there willingly? And it's the same thing as moving to Lovecraft, Massachusetts. Why would you do that? And he has moved away from there. He has moved to Seattle, which is all the way on the other side. It's the new part of the country. You know, it's the shiny part that doesn't have as much history. It, it has a history of its own, which is kind of shady, some parts of it, but metaphorically. Um, he has never talked about his past. He has never brought his family back to this house. 
but he's murdered and they move back to this house. Uh, so they, they literally pick up and move to the past. Um, and it's this very creepy old house on the coastline in Massachusetts. And of course, immediately weird things start to happen. There's a well house that has an echo that starts to talk back. And then the children in the family start to find these keys that work on specific doors in the house. And each of the doors does something weird. One of them turns you into a ghost. One of them lets you go anywhere you want. Um, one of them lets you go inside your own head. But the idea of this is that going back to the past has subjected them to whatever curse is on their father's family. Now it's on them. Um, so it's a really good, really good example of the New England Gothic, even though it's set, you know, in a modern time. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is Midwestern Gothic, which is one that I have the least experience with personally, um, but it's very interesting. So it sort of shares this strange, grotesque, strained and mental state with elements of the supernatural with the Southern Gothic, but it adds this restraint and unspoken. So, so the scary thing about the Midwestern Gothic is that this stuff is happening to all these people, but nobody talks about it. So you're very, you're physically isolated. Um, for people who haven't been to the States, the Midwest is most of the, you know, it's the middle. It's huge. And the space is huge. And there are big mountains. And there are a lot of towns that are very isolated. And there's like nothing around them for miles and miles and miles. And it's just, it's vast. And in the winter, it snows and you get, you can get stuck. Um, so physically it's isolating. And then emotionally it's isolating because in these stories, these things are happening and they're happening to everyone. And you're physically isolated in this little town and then nobody's talking about it. So it feels like it's happening to you alone. Um, the foundational figures are Alfonso Wetmore and Ward Durant, and the comic that I'm using for this one is um, Revival by Tim Seeley and Mike Norton. Um, so it takes place in this tiny town in Wisconsin, which is a big state and very isolated in the winter, and the story does start in the winter. Um, and the premise is that everyone died who died on January 1st comes back January 2nd, but nobody knows why. Nobody knows how. They don't know if it's a miracle or if it's science or what. So it's this small town that's already isolated with this bizarre happening that nobody understands. And then the CDC comes in and isolates them further and then takes all the people who are revived and isolates them in a camp. So they can't talk to their family. Their family doesn't know what's going on with them. Nobody's talking to each other. And then they're twice isolated, both by space and then by the CDC. And then there's, there's ghosts and all this other stuff. And then there's this physical void of being isolated. And then people who have been in the void and got pulled back and aren't talking about it. So it, it's just people are levels of isolation. That's absolutely terrifying. So that's the idea of the Midwestern Gothic. Um, is sort of the isolation upon isolation upon isolation. So we have these literal translations of the Gothic, but then we get into this place where, you know, comics writers and people who write comics and people who draw comics have struggled for years and years and years to get the literary world, for lack of a better term, to accept comics and graphic novels as books, as a legitimate form of storytelling. And there has been progress, although there are still plenty of people who will tell you that they are not real books, um, they are not legitimate form of literature, teachers shouldn't use them in classrooms, they're not a legitimate thing to read. Um, you know, I've had people in the family tell my kids, you know, like, no, don't bring that, bring a real book. 
but that is neither here nor there. Anyway, there is one place where that attitude comes in handy, and that's when we get to use comics to be transgressive as readers and writers. So where we see that happen is in a couple of different places. So comics kind of are allowed to play in the literary hot tub on occasion, as long as we don't infect real literature with our capes and tights. So what we have is this conflict where people think of comics as a, as a genre. They think of it as superhero writing. But in fact, comics are a medium, right? They're a way to tell a story, not a kind of story. And historically, it's been a very narrow view, but you can tell any story in a comic. Um, I have sitting with me right now, one of my absolute favorites, which is the manga, um, Way of the House Husband. And this is a whole, I think there are eight or 10 volumes out in, in Japan that are being translated gradually into English. It's about um, a Yakuza hitman who retires to become a house husband because he wants to support his wife who has this great corporate job and she's busy all the time. So it becomes his purpose to support her and make her lunch and clean the house. And he tries really hard to do this while people are still trying to kill him because he still has this reputation. Um, there's one called um, My Boyfriend is a Bear, which is about this woman who gets so fed up dating trash men that she's on a camping trip and she meets an actual bear and they start dating. Um, it sounds ridiculous, but it's actually very, very cute. Um, and, you know, it's, it's this sort of allegorical story told literally. Um, there's one, another manga I talked about this morning called, and again, I say this every time I talk about it, but uh, I'm sure the, the title is more succinct in Japanese, but in English it's, I married my best friend to piss my parents off um, about a woman, you know, women in Japan to a large extent are still expected to get married when they're in their early 30s. And she likes her life, she likes her job. So she and her, her best friend cook up this plan that they're gonna get a same-sex union so that her parents will leave her alone, um, but they end up falling in love. Um, there's uh, one called Prince of Cats, which is a retelling of, uh, like a street retelling of a Romeo and Juliet from, I wanna say it's Tybalt's point of view. Um, you can tell, I have, I have comic book cookbooks, like I've learned to cook Korean food from an illustrated comic book cookbook. I learned to make ramen at home from one as well. So you can do, you can tell any story you want. So comics, again, they're a medium, they're not a genre. A lot of people still think Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, that's it. That's all you can do with it. So that's where part of our problem comes in. Um, but in a way, there's a way that that's good, which is if the general world is sort of dismissive of comics, we can mess around with what's been with established tropes and kind of create new subgenres and kind of stir the pot without the literary world noticing. And when what tends to happen is that those ideas kind of, they go from comics to pop culture, pop culture to sort of literary fiction. And by the time, you know, the gatekeepers are engaging the locks, it's too late because we've already messed with their castles, told their secrets, queered their relationships and stolen their girls. Um, and what's extra cool about this is that a lot of those efforts are spearheaded by women. Um, and, and when I say women, I say anyone who identifies as female and then LGBT creative teams. So um, the first example is where we end up having new subgenres. Um, and one of them is Pennsylvania Gothic, which is 
near to my heart because it is focused on the part of Pennsylvania where I actually live. Um, and you guys may know Carmen Maria Machado as a memoir writer and a short story writer, but she wrote a comic, uh, DC and Joe Hill partnered to do a line of limited horror comics, limited run horror comics. And this was the first comic that she wrote. And she said she'd had this idea. I had a chance to interview her about it. And she said she'd had this idea for a long time of, of Pennsylvania Gothic, but didn't have a place to put it until she had the opportunity to write a comic. And this Pennsylvania Gothic, she got this idea, um, this part of Pennsylvania, there was a lot of steel mining and coal mining um, back in the day, not so much anymore. But what happened is that you had this industry and na versus nature, man versus nature. And what is particularly interesting here is that nature fought back uh, there's a town specifically that she mentioned when I talked to her about it called Centralia, where there's a coal mine that's been on fire since the 60s. They can't put it out. Um, there are seven people still living in the town by special dispensation of the government because they told everybody else to leave um, because of all the, you know, the health issues that living over a coal mine that's on fire long term can cause. They're not sure how it started. They're not sure why they can't put it out, but they can't. Um, so it's this idea of man pressing into nature, nature pressing back and winning, which doesn't necessarily happen very often. Um, there's also a lot of resorts in the Poconos, which are our little mountains, not the, you know, big like the Rockies or anything like that, but um, the little mountains that we have in this part of the country there are a lot of, of summer tourist spots. Like if you watched um, Mrs. Maisel, that summer resort where they go, that is legit. My dad worked at one of those places um, when he was in high school and college. Um, and they were just, uh, people stopped going. So the owners just packed up and left. So, you know, in a very Gothic fashion, they were these castles, luxury castles on a hill. And people just left, and now nature has reclaimed a lot of a lot of these spots. Um, so it's these natural features as monsters. In this case, in this book, they're literal monsters. Um, but you can go check these places. That you can go to Centralia and watch the smoke come out of the ground, and you can drive up into the mountains and see these um, abandoned resorts. So, and it's very specific to this part of the country. Um, so, you know, she created this whole new subgenre, which I personally, again, living here, would love to see more of because it is super creepy. Um, you know, nature taking back what people took from it. Um, and then we have this idea of salvation by the transgression, by, tra by what at one point was considered transgressive. Um, this is another dead man story. It's actually a graphic novel where, you know, it's got the house, uh, got the ghost, it's got all the elements of a traditional gothic story, except the inheritance part. Um, but what ends up happening is that uh, the main character's name is Bernice. I realize I totally skipped giving any kind of synopsis of this book this morning. Um, the main character Bernice has come to this house with her boyfriend. He's writing a novel, or so he claims. Um, and she can speak to the dead. But you no, know, she doesn't tell anybody that, of course, except for her friend Sam. Sam is one of the first um, major non binary characters to ever show up in a comic book. And um, Dead Man is called to this house. He hears the ghost. He knows something shady is going on. So he comes to this house and he gets trapped there with this other ghost. So it's kind of this big detective story of trying to figure out why the ghost is trapped there, why he's trapped there, um, and exactly what's going on. But what ultimately, I don't want to give away too much because this is a great book and you should all read it. 
uh, whether you've ever read a graphic novel before or not, this one is really neat and it's really beautiful. That very first slide is actually um, a variant cover from one of the artists. Um, the traditional relationship that would normally be the heroine salvation, so her with this dude, is the dangerous one. And what saves her is her relationship. She falls in love with Sam. So this, what would have traditionally been a transgressive relationship, which is the LGBT one, is what saves her. Um, and Dead Man, who's the superhero, has no real, he has a stake in the story in that he's trapped in the house and he does want to help, but he doesn't get anything out of it. He's not particularly Byronic. He's not, he's pretty competent, but like he, he doesn't get, um, he doesn't get the girl. He doesn't get a reward of any kind. Um, he just helps and then he's free and he's like, all right, see ya. And really the only way to save everyone is to just literally burn it down. So no one's inheriting anything here. Um, they're essentially burning tradition down quite literally with a giant fire um, and starting all over again. So I really love this book um, because again, you know, it, it, very literally takes all of these traditional tropes and it's like, nope, 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 nope. And uh, it's, it's a neat comparison to what would be considered to be, you know, the traditional things that save someone. And then you start to see this in other comics and then in other novels. Although, again, DC has not necessarily been the best of it. And as you can see, Sarah Vaughn, um, was the writer on this. So again, we have a woman-led creative team on this very transgressive book. Um, so that's that's comics and the gothic. That's me. That's where you can find me. Um, and so, um, you know, obviously, same as with Kovai, I this was my privilege to do and it was really fun and I actually learned a lot during the presentation. Um, but if you're going, if you were going to drop some money in or you would like to, um, I am asking if instead you would be willing to donate to the ACLU or uh, the Trans Women of Color Collective. Um, or if you're going to buy any of the books we talked about or just your next book, that is a link and I'll post these on Twitter. I posted them earlier. I'll post them again. That is a um, list of black owned bookstores. If you're not in the US and you can't access them, then let me know and I'll see what I can find for you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, it was different than this morning as well. So I've learned new things. Amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure I'm saying that for everyone as well as just me. You are actually also to the minute exactly the same finishing time. Amazing. Well done. <laughs> um, so if anybody has um, any questions, then do feel free right now. You can pop them in the chat. You can ask them by video, but as I say, if you want to ask them by video, we'll either hear your voice or see your picture. So if you're not happy with that, then just pop it in the chat, if you would. Um, yeah, so I will await some questions in the side. I know it takes a minute to write them up. Okay, you've got one. Yes, they are. Um, most of them are wrapping up because they were limited uh, miniseries, but they may do more. I think they did pretty well. Um, my husband has read all of them, I think. Um, some of them are more gory. Some of them are more creepy. 
So if you're not, um, basket full of heads is really gory. Uh, I think the dollhouse is more toward creepy. Uh, I'm trying to think about that one. There's one called Sea Dogs, which um, they put part of it in every issue of every comic, but I'm sure they'll do a trade paperback that collects them all at the end. Um, can I connect it all to Nightwing's Perfect Butt? Nightwing's Perfect Butt is everything. Very funny, Tika. <laughs> That's why they like acrobats so much, because of the perfect butt. Uh, Nightwing's, Dick Grayson it was the first Robin, and his, his perfect butt is a theme in comics. Everybody likes his butt. He's cool with it. <laughs> um, yeah, the Pennsylvania Gothic thing is cool. I actually, um, I can put, post a link to my interview with her about it. Um, I just thought that was the coolest thing. She's like, I've been sitting on this for years and um, I never had a place to put it before I was offered the chance to do this comic. Um, and it's different than her other stuff because she does a lot of, a lot of uh, body horror. Um, and there is some body horror in this. The premise is, the way the story starts is that uh, these two girls wake up in the movie theater and they remember sitting down to see the movie, but nothing else until they wake up. And it's this whole, the women in this village are, uh, are afflicted with this weird thing of not remembering what happened to them. So that's connected into the story too. <laughs> That is very true. Yeah, lock and key. Um, the the um, I don't love the art. Um, it is, it's a little older. Um, it's not my favorite style of art. Um, I love the story, and the um, that's another one where the the adaptation definitely. Um, they, they grabbed the sensibility really well. I think they did a good job. Um, I also like that they expanded the Duncan's role. The uncle does not have as big of a role in the comic. He's just kind of there, and I wasn't sure why, so I was really glad they gave him an actual reason for being there in the TV series. And also, I love Aaron Ashmore from Killjoys. I think he's great. Yes, the excessive capes, exactly. It's to hide the butt. <laughs> um, <laughs> just so you know you've made a talk about butts <laughs> for the recording guys what you like <laughs> oh I, I i will talk about nightwing's butt all day that's what she knows this she's baiting me <laughs> um so anyway, it's amazing. I always come back to the fact that, oh, she has a real question. I don't believe you, Tika. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I was looking into West Coast Gothic face a little bit. Um, yes, it's not a com the um, it's not a comics. I have to look into comics that are West Coast Gothic based, but the the most recent um, uh, Sarah Coons book, the heroine series, the most recent one, she took a bunch of the stories about, um, I wanna say it's Mills College, is it Mills College? That's the all women's school in Oakland. And uh, there are many stories, specifically specific ghost stories about hauntings at that college and she um, worked with a lot of those in her most recent book. Um, so that one definitely is, but I will, I will see what I can find. Yeah, the California Gothic is different uh, again because it's new. There's a lot of gold rush stuff. I will definitely look into that more. Um. I was going to ask you, and this is just me because it's just not my area of expertise. I'm like super British focused in my research because <laughs> um, I do 18th century stuff, you know. 
Um, but like, when you were talking about the Southern Gothic and this kind of idea of the return of this repressed past, like all the writers that you were mentioning were, well, I think they were all white um, mm -hmm. and some of them were racist, right? Poe, oh, yes. I'm wrong. So like, yes. is, it, is the Southern Gothic um, a sort of white genre and then how do you classify black writers in, uh, do black writers write Southern Gothic as well or is it a different genre? I'm not, yes. I just don't really know. They do. It, I think it was kind of like we were talking about last, we were having a discussion last week about when you look back at genres and where they came from. Mm. Um, it is definitely, the genre definitely has, is more diverse now. Um, and it probably was the beginning and that's probably a gap that I need to do more research on because I think when, I think what we learn about in school as quote canon is probably lacking or at least what I learned about when I was in school a very long time ago. Um, Attica Locke writes some stuff that Southern Gothic. Um, I think off the top of my head. Um, Cami Garcia writes some stuff that Southern Gothic. Uh, I will research this. Sorry to for sure. No, no, no. That's okay. It's it's not. Mm -hmm. But I think I think it suffers from the same failure that a lot of genres have suffered from, and that the American educational system has suffered from, which is we learned about the white writers. Mm -hmm. um, and we should have learned a lot more. Yeah. And, and it's the same thing with comics. Most of these, most of these comics were um, white men, which I was excited that when I got to looking at what was more subversive, it was women. Um, but it's another, it's another publishing where it's changing finally, but very, very slowly. Um, which is also why I very much wanted to include David um, because I think the work he is doing in terms of both writing and advocacy for, um, you know, it, the Frederick Douglass memoir, he's, he's like, I want specifically, I, he said, you know, I don't feel like black kids who go to school in like Detroit and you know other large cities they don't have access to their own history because they go to schools that are underfunded and they don't have the educational opportunities and this is my way of giving them that opportunity. Yeah. Um, which I have a friend who's a teacher in Seattle, which is another place where there's huge educational disparities. And I deliberately buy graphic novels for her class um, cool. so that her kids do have access to them. She's a cool teacher, so she lets me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I think, I think it's an interesting point that you raised that like, yes, there were black writers, there always have been, but not we didn't learn about them so i think that's a fault in our educational system that needs to be remedied so i will do that research and i will post it when i find it it just it seems sort of like there's they're coming from two different places if it's a white writer that's themselves you know like poe or even faulkner sort of mm -hmm. that they're also um engaged in the act of repression whereas yes. a writer like tony morrison in beloved for example would be they're not engaged in the act of oppression but mm -hmm. they're depicting similarly that kind of inability to erase the past mm -hmm. by depicting it from a, a position of it shouldn't you know what i mean there's a different kind yeah. of ability or a different uh, uh engagement i guess well i've also seen a lot of interesting discussion especially in the last couple of days about white writers writing black characters like that's not your space and there was a book i had read recently where 
a writer had done that and I was like, I had not thought about that that way. So, you know, I think, I think that's some education that needs to be done as well. Like, you know, uh, uh, someone said to this writer, like that was writing this love story between a black character and a Latinx character was not your story to tell. And I had read the book and I had enjoyed it. And I was like, huh, like I'm relatively well educated. I'm, you know, I try to pay attention to what's going on in the world, but I hadn't thought of that. So I was like, okay, well, shame on me. I need to educate myself better on that. So, you know, everyone's learning all the time and uh, everyone's learning all the time. So, you know, you have to start somewhere and then you learn a more, little more every day and, you know, you apply that when you do something like this. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, that's why it was really important to me to include, um, include what I had learned from David at that panel, mm -hmm. you know, and why I push really hard when people say, you know, graphic novels aren't books. Well, that's really easy to say if you're a upper class white person who went to Carnegie Mellon and has a graduate degree, but you know, it's different if you had a different life. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any more questions or ideas that they want to share or bring up with us? Um, you're always super welcome. Share your expertise, share your ideas, share your questions. No. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing the talk twice in one day. <laughs> twice in one day. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll give you a couple of announcements for next week, if I may, um, everyone. Um, and do feel free to be thanking Sherry as well yourselves if you want to. Um, uh, so next week, what's going on? There's a takeover of the classes. Uh, I'm not doing anything apart from sitting here and introducing stuff. Uh, so lovely, uh, delightful. We're going to be watching a film on Wednesday. Um, we're going to be watching a Mexican horror film to be decided based on a poll. Uh, Thursday book group, we're reading The Monk by Matthew Lewis. So I'm having a little bit of an 18th century moment with you, finally dragging you into the 18th century with me. Um, and then the next weekend, we have two guest speakers. So um, on Saturday, uh, uh, a colleague of mine that I know from back in the day, um, Valeria is going to be talking about the Bruja, the witch in Mexican film. And then Abraham, who's right here in the corner on my screen, um, is going to be talking about Mexican mummies on Sunday. So if you haven't signed up for any of those, uh, uh, give me a shout on Twitter or go to the webpage at romancingthegothic.wordpress.com um, and you can sign up for stuff. You can see what else we've got booked to go. Um, and if you have any suggestions or requests, do feel free to send them to me because I am feeling brave at the moment. I'm happy to go out and approach people right now. <laughs> do feel free. Um, does anyone have any further comments or anything they want to say before I turn off the recording? I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. It was a lovely, uh, fantastic uh, expo exposure to these titles. I didn't know many of them, so my reading list just went huge. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, see you next week to all of you. And thank you, Dr. Hurst, for organizing these uh, lovely moments in our lives. Thank you. That's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. I know our reading lists are getting ridiculous at <laughs> this stage. I feel like all of us are having this like constant sort of sense of, oh no, I've written another 10 books down this week. <laughs> oh, what to do? Um, one day we might get ahead of it. Um, if, I, if we sort of take a break for a year of classes, <laughs> we might catch up with ourselves. <laughs> Probably not though. I'll just see stuff that gets uh, put up on Twitter and buy that as well. Um, anyway, so thank you so much for coming everybody and I will see everybody hopefully next week for something. Um, or as I say, do feel free to get in contact with me in between times. Thank you very much. And thank you to Shiri. Thank it was you. great. Again. Abraham, I can't wait for next week. Yes, same. I'm so excited. <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs>